Thank you for watching Thirsty with Tony. I appreciate your watching my videos. If you like them, don't forget to share them with your friends, subscribe, and give them a thumbs up. Well, you know, I'm a big fan of history, visiting historic places, reading historical novels, and things of that nature. Well, today, our video is about the area where the longest siege in the Revolutionary War took place. Join me now for a look at the 96th historical site. Thank you. In November 19 through the 21st, 1775, local loyalists attacked the stockade that would become known as Fort Williamson without success. Bear in mind that this was only five months after the shot heard round the world at Lexington and Concord. Major Andrew Williamson was a patriot commander of the fort. Williamson had recaptured a shipment of gunpowder en route to the Cherokees. With some 500 patriots, he built the stockade that would have his name. Williamson wisely decided to let the Loyalists attack, since he was outnumbered almost four to one. One attack effort by the Loyalists was quite interesting. Imagine, if you will, that you're huddled behind a makeshift shield with four other men trying to get closer to the stockade. It's a cold Sunday morning with the temperature approaching freezing. It's uphill. Your feet slip and slide on the freezing wet grass. Patriots are taking shots at you from behind the wall. The man in front of you is firing flaming arrows at the wall. But the wet grass and wall won't catch fire. Everything is wet from the morning's heavy frost. You and your fellow militiamen soon give up on this assault and rejoin the rest of the company at the bottom of the hill. On the 21st of November, the warring parties called a truce and exchanged prisoners. The first South Carolina Patriot was killed and buried here. It was the first major conflict of the American Revolution in South Carolina. These sharpened poles driven into the earth are called palisades. Imagine trying to get past these to climb an earthen wall. These could stop man or beast. Let's look inside the stockade fort. The exterior is what you'd expect from an 18th century stockade. Sharpened poles set in the ground. Palisades, like we saw earlier, would have been used too. Well, think about it. You look like a bunch of ladies. Some kind of a French country. Some six years later, the area had grown considerably. By the year 1781, the town had 13 houses, plus a jail and a courthouse. Located at a crossroads, one of the nine roads was the Charleston Road, which connected the coastal city to the Blue Ridge Mountains. It was the commercial and judicial center of the British colonial backcountry. Its name supposedly came from the fact that it was 96 miles from the nearest Cherokee town. Probably like a couple of old parts. A couple of old parts. Here was a local concentration of loyalists to the Crown. The majority of the supporters of the British were on the coast, while those in upcountry were primarily Scots Irish and German ancestry and were supported of the American cause. Behind me is Star Fort National Historic Site. You can't see it very well, but those earthen mounds behind me actually form the shape of a star. 
Uh, in the time it was used, they were 17 feet high. In the summer of 1781, there would have been a flurry of activity in 96. The fort at 96 was a British royalist fortress in the backcountry, manned by 550 conscript soldiers from New York and New Jersey, plus local royalists. There were no soldiers of the British Isles. The battle would be between Americans, indeed, a Civil War battle. Lieutenant Colonel John Harris Kruger was a commanding officer of the British force. Kruger was born in Jamaica, but grew up in New York. He was commissioned into the Army as a light colonel and inherited the command of his father-in-law's brigade, the Lance's Brigade. He was responsible for the unique design and construction of the fort, which allowed defending from any direction a star fort. General Nathaniel Green and the Southern Continental Army had moved his army south. When Green arrived at 96, he had had over 1,000 Continental troops plus militia. Also, the militia commanders, Andrew Pickens, Francis Marion, Thomas Sumter, and their militiamen. Green had Colonel Light Horse Harry Lee and the Polish engineer, Colonel Thaddeus Kutuska, among the, uh, his officers. He had three field pieces, six pound cannon. The 42-year-old Quaker from Rhode Island used an age-old tactic, perhaps as old as warfare itself, siege warfare. The idea was simple. Cut off your adversary from the outside world. Don't let him have access to water or food, and of course, war material. The 43-year-old New Yorker and commander of the Clancy Brigade was ready for Green on May the 22nd, 1781. He beefed up his defenses. He did his sandbags to the top of the palisades, and his 550 troops were ready. His small three-pounder cannon was ready, although he had no artillerymen. Green approached the fort with the Continental soldiers and cavalry under the command of Colonel Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee. Lee was the father of General Robert E. Lee. Green would send Lee and Pickens to attack the fort in Augusta, Georgia. They followed his orders and returned at the capture of the British fort in June 8th. The siege at Star Fort would last until June 18th, the longest siege of the Revolutionary War. A 40-foot tower was used to allow truck shooters to fire into the fort, and they easily picked off loyalists inside the fort. Marion had used such a tower quite successfully in Captain Fort Watson. But the clever Kruger countered by piling sandbags higher on the wall of the fort. The trench system was designed by the Polish engineer, Colonel Thaddeus Kajusko. Heated cannonballs were fired into the fort in an attempt to start fires inside the fort. Flaming arrows were fired into the fort, too. But Kruger removed the flammable roof from the building. Green's next step was to tunnel under the wall to place explosives there, as supervised by Colonel Petrusco. An explosion under the wall would cause it to collapse, thereby allowing the Patriots to enter. The tunnel was never completed. The siege in the church. The Patriots did breach the fort's walls once. Once past the moat, they climbed the 17 foot palisades. They used poles to hook on them to pull down the sandbags. The Patriots' victorious entry into the fort was enjoyed briefly. The lawyers quickly forced the intruders out with fixed bayonets. For whatever reason, Green was never able to restrict the water supply from the loyalists. They had dug the long trench from the respective fortifications to the water source, Spring Branch, and covered it. Green sharpshooters with their rifles could have easily shot anyone getting water from the branch if they were visible. Some of the sharpshooters had hit their targets at a distance of 2,000 yards. On June 18, 1781, General Green received a message that Light Colonel Francis Routon was en route from Charleston to reinforce Light Colonel Kruger with 2,000 redcoats. Green withdrew from Star Fort. After the withdrawal, Green blamed Sumter and Marion for the lack of support. They, in turn, blamed Green. But Lee blamed the Polish engineer for the design of the trenches. 
The Patriots, with superior numbers of men and more powerful artillery, managed to pull the feet from the jaws of victory. Thanks for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe and share the video with your friends. A thumbs up helps my channel grow too. Other videos are available as you can check out my playlist as well as what's coming up next.